Um, what I'm going to talk about is not so much a history of the culture as a, a, a part of Mike's history, which was quite remarkable, a period from about 1870 to 1920. And I got, I've been interested in it for a long time, thinking about the antiquarian interest in the island, which dates back, some of the earliest antiquarians were busily working in the 1700s, sort of the early 1700s, they started collecting folklore. But it's that particular moment from about um, 1870, 1880, which things really started to get going. And I was intrigued as to why, and what I'm going to talk about is who was involved, what their backgrounds were, what their education was, because the education ranges from primary, elementary, um, right through to Oxford and Cambridge. So these are people working at different levels, but all achieving tremendous things in their own fields. And we also have to remember that in those days, there were no courses for people to go to. There was no training to be a folklorist. There was no training to be a folk song collector. There was training, of course, to be a historian. And I should be coming to some of that. But you'll recognise a lot of the images here. Those of you from Belaf will recognise our wonderful cross in the old church, which I have to put up there, of course. On the right-hand side is a, a piece of work by Archibald Knox, who, of course, was schooled in um, Douglas, went to the Douglas School of Art, and didn't do any more training in art after that, which is interesting. He trained with John Miller Nicholson. I'll talk a bit about, more about that. And the jewellery, of course, that he designed too. W.H. Gill and Manx National Songs, which was an amazing achievement. It's never been out of print since it was first published in 1896. Now, there's not many books you can say that. And John Miller Nicholson, of course, on the left, that beautiful painting, um, he, had, he was very much, very much of the Impressionist school. And also on the right-hand side, the people who collected the language and recorded it. And before I forget, I shall, um, some of you will have heard Mona Douglas talking many years ago about how the Manx language recording van came about, the equipment. De Valera had come over to the Isle of Man and he was being, you know, I don't know about being wined and dined, but certainly he was being fated and um, being given a lot of um, attention. But the person he wanted to meet was Mona. And she claimed, but no one ever knows if this is true or not, because she did tell one or two st t quite tall stories. Those of you who know her will remember that, that she once hid him in her wardrobe during the um, 19, um, 1916 uprising in Dublin. She was working there at the time. It's a good story anyway. And he did ask particularly to speak to her. And then they were talking about the language and she said, of course, it needs to be recorded. He said, we'll send our equipment over for you to, to use got back to Dublin, passed on the message, and they said, but we don't have any recording equipment. <laughs> so the, um, that particular comment was the um, sort of sparking point for the Irish buying their recording equipment. So that's quite an interesting one. So I didn't want to miss that bit out particularly. I should be talking a bit about Mona. But I need to put it in a bigger scale as well, a much more international scale, because... That particular thing that was happening between 1870, 1880 and 1920 is not just confined to the island. You've got the Celtic revival in Ireland. You've got the Druids um, in Wales and in Brittany and in Cornwall. But it's further afield than that. The whole of Europe was simmering. Even places like France had their rebel... Well, obviously, they'd had their... Um, French Revolution earlier on. But if you look at that map, you'll see lots of red stars around there. And that was where there were revolutions going on during the middle of the, um, the early 1800s and the middle of the century. Italy was not a country at this stage. It was still a whole lot of, of regions. It, it, didn't, it didn't actually work as a country. Germany didn't either. Again, lots of little bishoprics, and lots of little kingdom, kingdoms and so on. But people were beginning to be interested in what they called the folk. Um, I'm a musician, and you get something like um, the beautiful maid of the mill, Schubert, Schöne Müllerin, the song cycle. This is about ordinary people. It's not about the gods and the emperors of the classical world. This is about real people. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. And that's what was going on in the island was all part of this a little bit later, but it's all part of the same movement. This is the sort of thing I mean. This is um, a wonderful artist. I'm very fond of um, George Clausen. 
And he was someone who went out and painted the ordinary people, the folk doing ordinary jobs. Here it looks as if they're lifting turnips, I think. <laughs> so this was unusual, this was new. And suddenly people thought, well, maybe these people have got something to offer. Maybe they have their own culture. And of course, that's what they were going to find out about it. And we've got this, as I mentioned, John Miller Nicholson, who's greatly influenced by the Impressionists. And in his turn, he taught Archibald Knox and, of course, influenced him greatly as well. But there were other influences coming in with Knox too. Knox, by the way, taught at Ramsey Grammar School. I don't know if you knew that. He taught my father in the... Um, somewhere, it'd be about 1922, I think, 23. And um, apparently he was known to go out at lunchtime and have the odd beer. <laughs> Come back in the afternoon... And on one particular occasion, and he had a beard, of course, on one particular occasion he came back and one of the boys in my dad's class said, Archie, you've been drinking. <laughs> I don't know what the outcome of that was. <laughs> well, there's a whole lot of names I'll be coming up with, which are very familiar for you, uh, for all of you, I'm sure. PMC Kermode, for instance. Now, he was, if you look at this, he was a self-taught naturalist and archaeologist. He was admitted to the Manx Bar, so he, he had got a very high level of education. But nonetheless, the things that we know him for now were self-taught. And I think that's really interesting. That This was available. that People could do this. They had the time. I don't know how they had the time. But by the time he was in... It, by the time it was 1922, when he was, um, what, in his early 40s, he was the director of the first Manx Museum. I think it was just one man and a part-time secretary. And they started to gather all this material together, which is part of the problem that the museum still has today, that it wasn't always listed properly when it arrived or as to where it was. So, for instance, um, a colleague of mine was finishing off his PhD some years ago, and he'd spent, what, five years or so collating several manuscripts. And um, he'd just got to within a month of submitting... And he went into the museum one day and Roger Sims said, oh, by the way, we found the master copy of all the things that you've been collating. <laughs> and Francis came over to me and his face was as white as a sheet. And I said, don't worry, you've, you've reconstructed a lot of them. Now you can say that you've, this has arrived and you've been able to compare them. So he did that and he got his PhD. PMC Kermode, Philip Kermode's sister, of course, was Cushig. Many of you will know her poetry, her poems. And what is so amazing about this man is that he raised the interest in the Manx grave markers, the Viking period grave markers, which you've got a fine collection in the church here anyway. What people didn't realise until then was that the collection of such markers is the best in the world apart from Norway itself. And that's something we need to beat the drum a little bit more about, I think, because we tend to think that you know, other people must have these. They do, but not as many and not as high a quality. So that's worth thinking about. And, of course, he was given a very important award by the Norwegians too. He was also a very fine draftsman. He published this book, Mike's Cross, as some of you, I'm sure, have got maybe an original edition or perhaps... I have a, a copy of it. I have an original one and a copy. I never use the original one. <laughs> I only use the copy. But um, it, it was a remarkable piece of work, um, listing the crosses that exist in the island. I've lost count of them now because they keep finding them, and, um, which is very exciting. I think you found one in Kirk Michael not so long ago. Is that right? I shan't say anything very much about that at the moment. The much, the much Roy Fenwick. Yeah, exactly, yes. And then, of course, Archie Knox himself, big international figure today. His work is going for tens of thousands in many cases. And um, I remember when I was working in Birmingham in the 1970s, a lot of the things that he made, the Tudric ware, the Cumric ware, that, all that beautiful pewter and silver ware, was actually made, manufactured in Birmingham. And I used to go down to the rag market on a Monday morning, very early on a Monday morning, and there was one stall just devoted to Archibald Knox's work. And I never saw anything on that um, table more than £12. Mm -hmm. This was 1976, bear in mind, 77. 
and I didn't have that sort of money. I, I just bought a house on my own. And I had a mortgage to pay off. But um, I, you know, I wish I'd perhaps taken out a bank loan at the time. <laughs> anyway, as I mentioned, he studied under John Miller Nicholson at the Douglas School of Art, and that's the level of his, his art education. He didn't go to the Slade. He didn't go to any of the, the places in London that you might expect him to. He became Liberty's prime designer. And as I say, his, his work cottoned on. But he was also influenced by the work that Kermode had done as well. He knew about the crosses, and you'll know about a lot of his work, not just the drawings, not just the paintings or the silverware, the metalwork, but also those memorials like Mackled in Churchyard, the Hall Cane Memorial in Mackled. And he bridged all these different movements. He, he wasn't a member of just one movement. The Celtic revival was there, very much there. There was the arts and crafts, and to a certain extent, modernism, but Art Nouveau, definitely. And you'll find work of his all over the place. If, wherever there's an Art mu Nouveau museum, you'll find that there's some Archibald Knox. Now, I've put this up. This is one of his great works, something called um, this St. Patrick's Breastplate. And if you look on the left there, there is actually a text. Can you work it out? That's right, God's wisdom to guide me. Well done. It takes a little bit of working out, but there you are. But it's that delicacy, that interlacing, the colours, very typical of Archie Knox. And on the right-hand side is a photograph I took in a little tiny settlement in western Norway called Urnes. And it's, a, it's, a, it's taller than I am, that particular piece of wood carving. And it dates back to about the um, ninth, uh, sorry, the 10th or the 11th century. And it's that sort of delicacy. If you look at the detail of it, there's actually a deer there. This is the deer's cry. And you, can you see there's a deer? Um, on the bottom of the image, bottom left, you can see its hind legs. Hind legs go up into the body. And then the, the four legs go up onto a very long neck. Round its neck, a snake, some sort of serpent has got its jaws, but the deer has also got its jaws around the serpent as well. It's all, but, but the delicacy of that, the carving is absolutely exquisite, and that's something that Knox has picked up on. So he's bringing international influence as well, not just the Manx stones. So just a very brief summary of what was going on to do with the recognition of an identity which is Manx, and that's quite important because um, certainly those of you who are my age will remember at school you were told, you know, anything, you know, you've got to forget Manx stuff. You've got to think about what's going on in England instead. Mid-18th century, I've already mentioned this widespread spread antiquarianism, something I want to look in more deeply. But it tends to be carried out by a lot of the clergy. A lot of, of the clergy are writing diaries or they're going out and recording areas that um, are sort of around about uh, sites, archaeological sites, they're, bu they're busily looking at those. Then in the 19th century, you get tourism. And to a certain extent, Manxon certainly in Douglas disappears to a great extent. Out in the countryside, it's still there. And that's what the visitors go out for. They want to see what's going on. They, you know, the classic thing that you heard was someone saying, um, that um, they were staying in Douglas, and the next day they said they were going to the Isle of Man tomorrow, <laughs> which was a nice summary of that. And then the Celtic Renaissance, of course, which was all part of the Celtic revival, Yeats and people like that, W.B. Yeats. And then, mirroring that, you get towards the end of the 19th century, sort of from the 1970, sorry, the end of the 20th century, from the 1970s onwards, and Ian will know all about this, the revival in Manxness and the revival of the language as well. It had been simmering away, but very small numbers of people involved in it. And then suddenly in the 1970s, it started to, to grow. And it, by the end of the 1970s, we had the Kroenig in Ramsey and then the introduction of Manx Gaelic in schools and the Manx school itself. So it's a sort of mirroring what was going on in the 19th century. But if you think about it, in the 19th century, it stopped around the sort of 
19 teens or 1920 because there'd been a great war. Um, there was the revival after the war, but people were still trying to, to make a living, to, to uh, scratch a living in some cases. And then there was the 1930s, which was pretty grim. And then the Second World War. So there wasn't the opportunity. And then the 50s in the island, um, some of you will re remember it, I'm sure, was a really bad time. Population down to 50,000. And people were having to go off the island for jobs, going to uh, pick sugar beet in East Anglia, for instance, just for the sake of earning money. So, you know, there was not the opportunity to have the the luxury, if you like, of cultural activities. So I began to think about what these people were doing, why they were doing it. Now, some of them were doing it to preserve the culture. Some were doing it to, really from the point of scholarship, people like A.W. Moore particularly. And also some were using it as a creative um, springboard, people like Archie Knox, for instance. So here's a lot of questions that I I'd like you to think about. I'm not going to ask you to discuss them now because that would be a whole session on its own, which would be great fun to do, I think. So um, why preserve the past? How do their approaches differ? Why were, they, why were they doing it? What are the sources that they were using? And do we know what the tradition was really like anyway? That's one of the big questions. You know, We've got all this music that was written down by people like Moore and Gill and Morrison and so on, but we don't know what sort of voices people used. We don't know what pitch they sang at. We don't know what speed they sang at. And we don't know if they actually did four bars followed by four bars or if they skipped. You know, there's so many questions there. Big question in the early 80s, I seem to remember, late 70s and early 1980s, was um, we should be doing it as they used to do it. And there were two schools of, of music in those days. One saying, no, let's develop it, let's do new things. And the other one, no, we've got to stick to the old ways. But should it be used as a platform for new traditions? And that's what's happened, of course, in music, certainly. And then who was involved? So I'm going to, first of all, deal with, let's, let's capture things. Let's record things before they disappear. And that happened particularly with the language, with archaeology, and with music, and of course with folklore. So you get a whole lot of people getting involved in this in all sorts of different ways, but not commenting on it so much as recording it, just writing things down so that they're not forgotten. And that was, rather, that was interesting. And I love this particular thing. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this. It's um, called Dedication, T.E. Brown. And I've highlighted particular lines because I think he summarizes what people were doing. What air is left to us of ancient heritage, of manners, speech, of honors, polity, all this I fain would fix upon the stage, on the page rather, sorry, may see as in a glass what they held dear, secure an anchor for their Celtic souls. Now, that to me summarizes so much of what was going on at the end of the 19th century. It, it, it's almost a sort of, uh, um, sort of guidelines for the people who are working in it. So let's look at some of the others then. John Clegg, he was a, quite an interesting man because he, um, was a, a, um, he was a doctor, a GP. He'd studied at Guy's Hospital. He had access to people in a way that a lot of these other people, like W.H. Gill, who was a man from across, you know, he had Manx roots, yes, but he lived and worked in London, very different. Dr. Clegg would go into people's houses, they would trust him, he was their doctor. Mm -hmm. He could talk to them in a way that some of these other people couldn't. And he was particularly important in the collecting of folklore and music. Because in many ways, I think he gets to the heart of what the music's about in a way that some of the others don't. That's just my own opinion, other people will possibly challenge me on that, which is good. And then there's the scholars. Let's study the past. People like A.W. Moore, that amazing history in two volumes, quite an extraordinary achievement for one man who was working anyway. It wasn't as if he, he was a, a full-time man of leisure. He had a job. These were the archaeologists, the historians, of course, those people who were involved in the language. It starts quite early on 
And um, there's one particular collection where it, it says, we're collecting the language of the Manx peasants, which is an interesting comment as well. That, that dates back quite a long time. But it's also collecting the Anglo-Manx dialect. And there's that wonderful book, which was Moore, Morrison and Goodwin, um, which is about the Anglo-Manx dialect. And I suspect Sophia Morrison had more of a hand in it that she, than, she had, um, than she was credited with. Because it's wonderful, because it's collecting the sayings for these um, dialect words. Not just saying this dialect word means so-and-so, but this is how it's used. And that, that was wonderful, the way that happens. And then, of course, the music, which I talked a little bit about, and I shall probably not talk too much about until I get to Gill. Look at this. This is the one I mentioned. This is Archibald Crajean. And to place the present publication within the reach of the peasantry of the Isle of Man, it has been greatly abridged from what we originally proposed. Now, whether that was from cost or whether it was actually because they felt it might not, people might not appreciate it, I don't know. But that's an intriguing comment. I don't know if some of you may have ideas about that. But A.W. Moore, look at his dates, 1853 to 1909, um, his interesting um, schooling, Douglas Prep School, and then rugby, and then Cambridge. He was Speaker of the House of Keys, and he made collections of, you name it, almost. He was quite an extraordinary man. Music, of course. His music was published, Manx Ballads and... Ballads and Music. Ballads and Music, that's it, there's Ballads and Music. Manx Ballads and Music <laughs> left me for a moment. That was published the same year as W.H. Gill's book, but it didn't go into a second, a second uh, edition until fairly recently, and it sort of fell out of use. I'll talk about that when we get to Gill. He also collected the Anglo-Manx dialect, of course, and the history of the Isle of Man in two volumes, which is still an amazing publication <laughs> over 100 years later. But also, look at all these others. There we are, Manx Ballads and Music, vocabulary of the Anglo-Manx dialect, folklore, and the history of the Isle of Man. Amazing publications, all absolutely standard and central to everything that was being done at the time. Another man, J.J. Neen. Um, he, was given, he was awarded an honorary degree from Liverpool for the work that he did. Interestingly, his work was supported by grants from Tinwald. Now, this is very far-sighted to Tinwald when you think when he was working, when he was, he was doing this sort of post-First post World War, that he was actually getting grants to be able to do the work. And that is amazing. It was happening in places like Norway, where they were giving grants to people who were researchers and musicians and artists. But it doesn't always happen in the Isle of Man. It does now, of course. Thankfully, we have wonderful sources of funding for people. He was a founding member of the Manx Language Society, Cheshire Gilgach. And he also was involved in the place names of the Isle of Man, which is, again, in six volumes each, well, six mini volumes, if you like. Each sheeting has got its own collection. And um, a language pr uh, primer, plays in dialect, plays in Manx. And he was awarded the Royal Norwegian Order of St. Olaf, which for his work, um, particularly with people like Marstrander, who was one of the great Norwegian linguists at the time. I don't know, do any of you recognise anyone on this photograph? <laughs> I think on the left, is it Bill Radcliffe? And I'm not sure who the one um, behind the vehicle is. Anybody have any ideas? I've been trying to work it out, but I couldn't. Anyway, two men, both Mike speakers, one from the north of the island, one from the south. They brought them together and they had a job, in a way, understanding each other because they spoke very different dialects. The northern and the south, southern dialects were quite different. So that was, that was an interesting one. That was um, the old gal, Mr. Neen, the blacksmith from the on the left there, the one with the white beard. Right, and then these people who are building on what exists. Let's take what we've got. Let's make it, bring it up to date, make it something different. And that applies particularly to literature and to the visual arts and, of course, to music talked a lot about music. I won't talk too much about that now. But I do want to talk about W.H. Gill very briefly because he was born in Sicily. His father, um, I think, was producing 
wine and, and um, supplied Napoleon and um, Wellington equally, apparently. He wasn't worried about who he supplied wines to. Um, he was educated. And this is an interesting one because King William's College becomes a hotbed for Manxness. A. W., um, Dr. Clegg went there and the two Gill brothers, W. H. Gill and his brother. Now, Gill himself worked in London in the seals office of the central post office. He used to come to the island in his summer holidays and he would walk around miles and miles and miles. He got to be quite well known and well known enough for people to hail him in Parliament Street and say, hey, Mr. Gill, I've got another tune for you. <laughs> So he, he, he managed to get through to people and he, he was, what he did was quite extraordinary. There had been publications of the folk songs of England, of Ireland, of Wales and of Scotland. And he did one which was the folk songs of the Isle of Man. They were, he changed the tunes around, he gave them different names, he gave them English words, he took a tune which might have words which were a bit sort of risque and he gave them words which were all right to be sung in a parlour, in the front parlour. <coughs> And that was why that book sold so well. I was brought up on it, I'm sure. I think Marilyn was probably brought up on it too, were you? <laughs> Certainly I was brought up on it. And um, at one point I knew every song in the book. I'm not sure I remember them all now, but at one point I did. And um, that gave me the taste for a lot of other things in, in terms of the music. I want to talk a little bit about the tune of Mulcairen. Some of you might have heard a bit of this story before, but I think it is fascinating. Mulcairen is a tune which has two versions, a major version which is quite jolly and a minor version which is a very sad ballad. Mulcairen's march is in 3-4 time. Now anyone who knows anything about music will know marches are usually in 4-4. Four, four. Otherwise you're doing 1-2-3, sort of waltzing along rather than <laughs> marching. But um, it was a tune which became very popular and it was sung at all sorts of occasions. It was used as a, tone, a tune when there were great dinners and there would be sort of a dozen toasts be made and there was always, Mullacharen was played when they toasted the Legislative Council or the Manx Legislature. So it, it had that connection. And there's a wonderful story by Canon Quine who wrote, and I'm convinced it was about <coughs> Kirk Michael, where there was um, a, uh, an evening do and they'd had their, they'd had their um, food and then the tables were cleared away and the band started playing. Now Ian will know that when you're playing that sort of thing you usually start off with something quite bright, lively, get people going. No, they played the minor version of Mulcairen and the women weeped, wept openly and the men pretended not to be moved. Now there's something more to this song, that's what gave me the starting point. This is Mulcairen's Cross, the one that um, was found and if you remember Lady New had a copy of it made and she wore it whenever she was on duty. Mid 19th century text for Mulcairen. Uh, read it. Um, oh, happy and free, Ellen Vannon, for thee, the hymn of old time I will raise, the hymn that was sung by thy bards when they strung their patriot harps in, in, your pra in thy praise. And so it goes on like this. It's very, very sort of Victorian. And, but it was interesting that it was written to that tune. Yes, Mulcairen. Since Ori the Dane, hard masters have kings been to thee, but under the queen, Ellen Vannon has seen the happiest child of the sea. Right, that's... But what was the meaning of it? The meaning is that Mulcairen was a miser. He, had a, he was widowed. He had a daughter who by this time was getting a little bit sort of elderly to marry. And he was... Um, he didn't really want her to marry anyway, but she did. And she found herself a husband and um, because she was of a certain age he had to pay the very first dowry that was ever paid in the Isle of Man. So he was cursed for that but his treasure it said, he did have treasure but it was under the ground, it was buried in the ground. Now is that saying that it was buried as part of the island's culture, part of its history mm -hmm. or was it actual treasure like Malacharen's cross, who knows? But the cross itself um, is, dates back, it's pre-Reformation. So the island was still Catholic, still Roman Catholic. He had this cross buried, supposedly, in his land. Does that mean that he was 
clinging on to the old ideas, that these are the old beliefs. Rex Kizik, who many of you will remember, who lived just down in, um, in Glen Willen, um, he, Glen Moore, sorry, <laughs> Glen Moore, um, he, um, he said that the island, the island's reformation only came with the, with the Methodism. That's an interesting comment, and I think it's, he wrote a very interesting pamphlet on it, which I can never find my copy, unfortunately. And this is, Molokaren was used as a sort of synonym for the Manx people, like John Bull is used for the English. And here we've got, um, don't vote for Anderson. This is a, a wonderful, you don't get this sort of thing nowadays. Um, this is addressed to Mr. Molokaren, a ballad Mac Moore in the sheeting of air. Now, there's no such place, but it, this is the sort of, the, the, this is the Manxman, that, and it's signed Kelly, but it's wonderful reasons why you shouldn't um, vote for him. One of them is that um, uh, it's, one, it's all about income tax anyway, and it, it, it's saying who can afford to, oh, I, 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 it's, it's another thing I can deal with another time, I think, I won't. But then comes the time when W.H. Gill publishes it in Manx songs, Mike's National Songs. And he puts it to words, and it's sung, as it always was at the end of Guild Week, a new arrangement of something was put on the back of the programme, and the audience would sing it, sight-sing it, in four parts. I think it should be reintroduced, if you'd not think so, be an idea. And the governor at the time was not very popular, but the governor's wife said, well, I think this is wonderful. Why not adopt it as the Manx anthem? Mm -hmm. And that's how it came about. Right, Sophia Morrison. This is a remarkable lady, quite extraordinary. Um, she was, um, again, a collector of stories, of songs, and of the Anglo-Manx dialect that I mentioned. But look, she didn't do, her education was peel cloth workers. She didn't go on to um, any sort of higher education at all or any further education. But the, the works that she did and some of the songs she collected and the stories she collected with them are quite extraordinary. And I think probably not well known enough, which I think is a pity. She was a huge influence, of course, on Mona Douglas. And here we have a lovely portrait of the young Mona. She was had homeschooling. She was too frail, too fragile as a child to go to school, would you believe? Her parents lived in the Wirral. They were bakers. And she was sent back to the island to live with her grandparents. And she went round with her grandfather to all the farms that he was visiting. And um, she picked up these stories. People would, when her, when her grandfather was on business, they... Um, one of the people in the house would probably take Mona aside and tell her some of these stories. And she wrote them down from a very early age, greatly influenced by Sophia Morrison. She had energy, quite extraordinary energy. She founded the, the refounded the Krunich in um, 1977 when she was, how old was she then? 79. That's not bad going for um, um, she, but before that, right through her early days, she had founded societies. She used to go into Albert Road School, where my mother was a pupil at the time, and she and Leighton Stoll would be um, teaching the children after school, teaching them dances. And she said the discussion between them used to get so heated sometimes that the children would be told to go out of the hall until the, the argument was over. <laughs> um, lots and lots of publications. She longed to be a journalist. And she, her wish was fulfilled much later in life. She's quite extraordinary. She lived up on, at the Larrick. She had a, a small holding up there. And she would deal with all the, the farm work before she went into the examiner office on the tram in the morning. She was alarming if you ever saw her driving because she had a mini. She was a very, very tiny person, about that high. And all you could see was the top of her head. <laughs> it looked like a driverless car. She was made a member of the Gorseth of Bards. This is the Stedford, the, the Welsh national Stedford, not the international one, in 1917, when she was still in her teens. She was a poet. And she was at the 1917 Gorseth, which was held in Birkenhead. I had the privilege of going with her to the national Stedford sometime, it must have been in the early 80s, I think, 
And she was the only person they reckoned who was still alive who had been at that particular event. And she was being interviewed by television, by radio. There was no stopping her. She, you know, was, she was in her element. Um, she was awarded the Manannan Trophy in 1972. Um, that was the, the pre precursor of the Rybelin of Manannan. That's another story which I won't go into at this stage. She was president of the International um, Celtic Congress. She was awarded the MBE. And um, then she was appointed to the Principal Order of the Gorset, a huge, huge honour, both for her, but for the island too. And then she was awarded the RBV, the Rybelin of Vannan, Vannan, posthumously. And I received it on her, I was asked to receive it on her behalf. She had died um, earlier on that year. So that was a great, I felt very honoured to be asked to do that. So let's summarise some of this then. Um, I sort of rambled on about some of them, but tried to give you an idea of the sort of people who were involved in this work, the, the wide range of education that they had, the wide range of interests they had. And they were actually applying new ground because, as I say, there were, there were no guidelines as to how to do this sort of thing. Nowadays, you can go off to somewhere like um, Newcastle University and um, do a course in, collect, in folk music. Nothing like that existed. People wouldn't even consider it. I remember I was, um, when I was doing my, my A-levels, and I was at school at Oxford. My parents had, had moved across by that time. They, and um, I was asked to write some sort of extended essay. And I said I wanted to do something on the music of the Isle of Man. And my teacher said, but there isn't any. <laughs> I, I just wish she was still around and I could say, yes, there is. <laughs> So let's see how these people were working then. We've got those people who were preserving what was there. People like Archie, um, Archibald Cregeen, the man who's preserving it for the Manx peasantry, um, and Dr. Clegg. You know, he was a busy man. He didn't have time to do very much, but what he did was quite amazing. And then people who were scholars, people like J.J. Neen, A.W. Moore, and the history of the Isle of Man, his folklore of the Isle of Man is quite extraordinary as well. Um, PMC Kermode, of course, we've mentioned. And then the creative people, the people like um, T.E. Brown, who was building on his understanding of what Manxness was. And that wonderful poem, The Dedication, which I think is, is absolutely, it, it's a wonderful summary of what a lot of them were trying to do. W.H. Gill, King Williams College again, um, M Miller Nicholson, Sophia Morrison, Archie Knox, Mona Douglas, and I didn't mention Hall Kane. Now Hall Kane, I don't know how many of you, I've got a whole lot of his books on my shelves. I haven't read all of them. I love The Deemster and The Manxman, and that's about it, I think. I haven't read any of the others for a long time. But at his height, he was one of the most popular authors that there was in the world. His books were translated into dozens of languages. And he wrote a book called The Little Man Island. Have any of you come across it? And it's really the most mm. wonderful tourist um, weapon. And people came over to see the places where his stories were set. And it is quite extraordinary that he then went completely out of fashion, whereas um, Hardy, who was um, also living about the same time as Kane, um, his work is still read today, Thomas Hardy. <coughs> So let's think about what they were doing. They were, they were very conscious that there was something in the island which was not English, Irish, Scottish, or Welsh. It was something very separate. And of course, the island is a mixture of so many of these different in influences. Um, it used to be that, um, certainly in the early days of the Kroenig, we looked to Ireland for a lot of influence, for a lot of, of ideas. But the more I went into it, the more I realized that we actually should be looking more at Scotland. Scotland's history and Scotland's music as well. It was individually driven. It, the, the, there was the Antiquarian Society, um, which many of you will be, belong to, I'm sure. But generally speaking, these are people who are working on their own individually, mainly because they, they, they were no doubt meeting each other, they were talking, they were uh, discussing what they were doing, but they went off and did their own thing. There was no planning. Uh, I did a lot of work on what was going on in Norway at the time. 
While they're going on in Norway, it was very interesting because it's all happening at the same time. Have we got time if I talk a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, just. Um, Norway, it's hard to believe now, but in the 19th century, Norway was a little bit of land tucked up on the you know, north of Europe somewhere, which no one went to. It was, it was one of the poor nations of Europe. Now it's got one of the largest sovereign wealth firms in the world. But um, they, people like Frederick Nansen, Friedhof Nansen, the great explorer, the, the polar explorer, he wanted Norway to get into the, the limelight a bit more. And there was a group of people who got together in Oslo, which was then called Christiania, showing it was still the Danish influence. And it was still part of Denmark, at, uh, well, it's part of Sweden at that point. And he said, we've got to have our own independence again. We've got to create it, we've got to do it. And how are we going to do it? We're going to look at the things that we're really good at. We're good at polar exploration. So let's put money into that. We're good at um, archeology, span we're good at Vikings. Let's put money into excavations and, and studying what the Vikings, what the great period was like, the sagas and so on. We're good at art. Let's give artists funding to do their work. Let's, literature, think of um, Ibsen, for instance. We've got Munch, Ibsen, Edward Grieg, no, some of the great names at the time. And the government put money into it, rather like they had done um, with J.J. Neen. They supported him with, with um, finance, with funding. But generally, it's not something that's organized on the island. It happens. It, it's not planned. It's generally fairly political, though um, not political in the party political sense, but political in the sense of saying that this is not the same as other places. I'm not quite sure I've put that together very well, but you know what I mean? It, it's not. Um, it's not driven like the Irish politics was. This was very different. It was keeping heads below the, the parapet, so to speak. Um, Cain, I've mentioned, was an international author, and Knox is now internationally recognized. It's been, it's an interesting story. As I say, it died out um, after the Second World War, or at least it, it didn't die out, it simmered down, and it just sort of bubbled under the surface for quite a long time. Mona Douglas, was quite amazing because she never gave up. You know, people laughed at her and um, they said, oh, you know, it's, it's a waste of time doing this sort of thing. But she persevered. And it was people like Mona who persevered. Sophia Morrison had died young, which was very sad, but other people were still doing things. The people who were collecting the language, they were all working quietly away, but very little money to support them and, and very little time because most of them were working full time. So that then is a little bit, just a sort of summary of some of the ideas that I've been working on for some time now, to see how the, all these figures fit together. The variety of education from Sophia Morrison at her elementary education, Peel Cloth Workers School, right up to someone like um, Moore, who went to Cambridge, rugby and Cambridge. You've, you've got the whole range of interests covering a whole You've got the creative writing of, of um, T.E. Brown and Hall Kane. You've got other people like Sophia Morrison collecting folk, folk stories and more as well collecting folk stories. You've got the artists who were, there, there was, up to that time, there was very little Manx art as such. But the Douglas School of Art was amazing because John Miller Nicholson really got people going on a Manx style of art. And I don't think enough work has been done on that. I'd like to see more work being done on that. Oh, there's so much to do and not enough time to do it all. <laughs> so maybe I've just tossed out one or two ideas for you know, little pieces of research that can all come together, which makes it exciting. I think I'll finish on that note. But thank you very much for being such a lovely audience. I've had a lovely time. Thank you.